the at the back of another class. Yes. So thank you, Jack, for for being here and talking. Well, it's a real pleasure because uh, I've been examining um, <laughs> what is now the you know the new centre for uh, innovative uh, lifelong learning. And the way in which the new technologies are being used there um, is, in, for me, inspirational. Um, and what I wanted to do today is just explore with you some of the important developments in qualitative research, um, which, again, some of you may find interesting and useful. Um, my own background, I started as a scientist. I did a year's um, research in an electrochemical laboratory when I finished my first degree. So I was very used to the quantitative methods of controlled experimental design and the use of the statistical analyses for actually looking at the significance of data. Now, when I came into education and I started to research my own practice, as I started to wonder about my influence in the learning of my students, I found, even though I was doing a psychology degree um, and I was being encouraged again to use controlled experimental designs uh, using Piaget and uh, cognitive states theory, Bloom's taxonomy, when I came to try and answer my question, how do I help my students to improve my learning, I just found that the methodology was just not appropriate. Because my question, how do I contribute to improving my student learning, required a qualitative approach where some of my values that I held could come into the research. Uh, I was very highly motivated to help to develop scientific understanding. And that motivation was uh, built on a love for what I was doing. But within my psychology degree and also within the philosophy before that, um, love was not acknowledged as a living standard of judgment. You know, you couldn't put <coughs> love as an academic standard, and yet, I knew that I loved what I was doing, and if you wanted to explain my influence on my students and omitted the love and the passion I felt uh, for my area, you wouldn't build a valid explanation. So that's why I really worked on the development of qualitative uh, research in trying to explain the educational influences, for example, of yourselves in higher education. How do we explain your educational influence with your students and also in your own learning? And the nature of those explanations, I would argue, require qualitative approaches. Now, before I show you what is available for you, freely available on the web, uh, in relation to qualitative research, and in particular, the accounts of researchers like ourselves that have already got their master's degrees through these approaches, and also their doctorates, I was going to ask you, and I do this in each of my keynotes, um, I was going to ask the audience if you have come with any question or issue of concern that you would like me to address. Because I find that the influences of my keynotes around the world are often dependent upon the audience's response, where they're coming with something that interests them, or they've got a question that they want to ask. And sometimes it's only at the end of the keynote, and they get a very limited question time and uh, often I'm not given the time to answer it. So I do like just to pause at the beginning of my keynotes, just to ask, have you come with any uh, question or issue that you would feel that you would like to address just in the next, uh, say, 45 minutes that we're together? Because it will be your questions, I think, that will be lasting in terms of the educational significance of what I do with you today. So is there anything that any of you have come with where you're feeling, yes, I would like just to address this issue or ask this question. In terms of, yeah? And if you give your name, so I can talk. Anita Rambuti Wong. I'm from the Faculty of Law and Management. Um, uh, like you said, I mean, with our training, I mean, we're so used to these uh, tools like SPSS. No matter what you, what kind of data you collect, you're just such in a rush to go and punch everything in because it's just such an easy tool to use. Yeah. But with call methods, uh, it's like you have such enjoyment in collecting qualitative data. It's so meaningful as an experience. But when you don't have the confidence with tools, uh, qualitative um, analysis tools, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a deterrent. Before you even embark, you're thinking, how on earth am I going to get all this analyzed? It's just rather intimidating. And um, 
the few tools that I've come across, I mean, you, you need to pay for them. Sometimes you can't get to use them properly, and then you're, you're running late on your project. And so it's a little bit of apprehension. Yeah, so that issue of the validity yeah. of the uh, narratives that are produced through qualitative research uh, is something I'll address you know, carefully, because uh, in my last 16 years at the University of Bath, there two of my doctoral students were awarded their degrees, a, a doctorates, using these qualitative approaches. And we developed very rigorous processes for enhancing the validity of the explanations, which fit in with actually the legal profession, where it's actually got to develop literally evidence beyond reasonable doubt. You know, if you're in a court of law with a jury, what you've got to do is to produce, if you like, a narrative which places beyond reasonable doubt that the person is guilty or innocent. Am I, do I make sense there? Now, the qualitative research that I do is based on a similar principle of you put it beyond reasonable doubt that the explanation that you're giving and the evidence you're bringing literally is beyond the reasonable doubt, you know, so it, it actually stands. So that's a really good area for us to um, focus on. Are there anything else that you're feeling? Yes, I, I would like to make sure that this is covered so that we actually get the most that we can from this time together. Just think, is there anything else? Yes. Um, my question is, are your uh, qualitative research methods specifically targeting the area of education, or do you look at applying your theories to areas beyond education? Because I come from an anthropological background, and I pretty long you know, do field work in kind of traditionally non-institutionalized settings. So I'm just uh, curious if your theories are also applicable beyond the, the sector of education. Yeah, and again, um, well, some of my uh, students come from um, industry. I, you know, I'll show you where you can access the doctorates. Uh, the police service, uh, health, um, the processes of validity actually come um, from a social scientist uh, called uh, Jürgen Habermas, who developed a critical theory of society. So. I've tried to work on processes of validation that you will, I think, recognize as valid in your own area using qualitative research. Let, so let's get any other questions that you feel that yes? It's not a question, it's more an issue.